So we're going to talk about articular cartilage, and articular car cartilage is that white tissue that that covers the uh, the articulating bone parts of the bone for in, in joints. Um, really cool stuff. And when we talk a little bit about the function, you'll see why it's um, why it's so unique. Unique enough that we have not been able to, to really reproduce it in uh, in a lab setting um, to correct significant articular cartilage defects. And if the de defect is, is big enough, we end up with joint replacements as opposed to uh, cartilage um, replacements. Which means that the tissue itself is has pretty limited blood supply, really no blood supply, no lymph supply, no neural input. So you don't really know you're wearing articular cartilage out until it's already gone. So when you start to have that arthritic knee pain, it's already too late because that's the that point at which the compression forces are actually uh, going through the articular end plates, end plates and the calcified bone, which in fact do have, have sensory um, nerves. So the cellular arrangement in a, a, a in articular cartilage, if we look at the whole thing, it's like I said, it's about five millimeters thick. Um, it'll vary. In, in smaller joints, in your fingers, it may only be a millimeter thick, and in, in larger areas like your knees, probably it, you know it's closer to um, to five millimeters. And the the arrangement is such that the the superficial layer, which we call the superficial tangential zone, is about ten to twenty percent of the total depth of the articular cartilage. And those those cells are laying, are aligned parallel to the joint surface or to the articular surface. The middle zone is much more random in nature. Um, call it the middle transitional uh, zone and, and it's 40 to 60% um, thick. And the, the, again, the cells are random, they're going all over the place. The deep zone is roughly 30% uh, and those, um, those cells are arranged, arranged more like a column. And so they're perpendicular to the, to the uh, calcified cartilage or in the subchondral bone. And that arrangement in of itself provides uh, kind of a unique resistance to different loads. If I'm looking at, at the superficial tangen tang tangential zone, <clears throat> does a great job at allowing fibers to or forces to slide back and forth. Whereas if I have a prolonged load and it gets all the way down to the deep zone, the columns will help prevent um, the load increasing onto the subchondral bone or the cancellous, uh, cancellous bone. So why do we have articular cartilage? What's the function? And the function is to spread the loads that are applied to the joint and to decrease friction. So we want to minimize the friction that is developing across the joint surfaces and we want to maximize uh, the freedom of movement and we want to spread, maximize the spread of the load uh, across the largest surface area that we can. And the way that we, that, that our uh, arterial cartilage starts to do this is, is a function of the composition. And 60 to 80 percent of the composition of articular cartilage is made up of water. So a lot of fluid, high, high water content, um, and we'll, we'll see what happens with that water as, as we start to apply loads. Now the other component is this, is this idea of this solid matrix. And the solid matrix is a combination of collagen fibers and this inner uh, fibril uh, proteoglycan gel. Um, and the proteoglycan gel has this high affinity for water. But let's talk for a second about the, the collagen. Typically type two collagen fibers um, and the behavior of the articular cartilage is really determined by the properties and the distribution of these individual components. Um, the most important mechanical property of the collagen is its tens tensile stiffness um, and its strong stuff, right? Remember how uh, collagen is the backbone for many of the tissues in our body. And it, so it, it really provides the, the collagen, the, the cartilage with its fibrous um, ultrastructure. So when we put the collagen together with the with the uh, hyperhydrated uh, proteoglycan, it provides resistance to um, to the stresses and the strains of, of articulation. So we need to look at then what the 
what makes up the proteoglycan. And the, and the basic building block of the proteoglycan is the glycosaminoglycan molecules. So the glycosaminoglycan molecules. They're long flexible chains of a repeating disaccharide which um, they kind of have this bottle brush uh, appearance um, and they're attached to a hyaluronic acid backbone. So they are strongly hydrophilic and they occupy a large solvent domain. Remember we talked about um, water being 60 to to 80 percent of the um, of the volume of articular cartilage, and part of that is because of the the interaction of the of the um, glycosaminoglycans pulls the water in. Now there is um, also a fixed negative charge that that surrounds each of the uh, glycosaminoglycans. And um, so they're they're repealed by the they're repealed by their fixed by these fixed charges. If we remember, you know, if I take the negative uh, side of two magnets and push them together, those magnets are going to repeal each other. And that's really how um, how a glycosaminoglycan chain will stiffly extend um, and, and kind of maintain this conformational state of, of within the within the tissue. So the concentration of the, of the solution of glycosaminoglycans, and you know um, we have uh, some ions that are surrounded with sodium and and um, and calcium, surround kind of clouded around are going to are going to create a an attraction a hydrophilic attraction. So we'll get uh, an, there'll be an attempt for these ions or these of these uh, of the structure to pull fluid into the articular space. Um, so we want to, you know, again, it, it likes that, that strongly hydrophilic um, solvent domain. It really pulls the, the fluid into that area. So how does all this stuff work? Well, when I look at the biomechanical behavior of articular cartilage, this is, is a, a function of viscoelasticity. It's, it's, it's really, um, it's really a, a function of how well we can uh, conform and deform and, and resist a change in shape. So the protoglycan in the in the cartilage are are prevented from you know from fully expanding uh, because of the collagen network. So I've got collagen in the way. So it doesn't fully ex expand. So that creates an osmotic pressure um, or a kind of a preload on this on this matrix. So when no external uh, when there's no external load that's that's applied to the articular cartilage, the collagen fibers and and are, are they're just kind of hanging out. There there's not an excessive amount of tension. But when a stress is applied to the articular surface and there's instantaneous deformation, so I have a compression. I have an instantaneous deformation. I have fluid moving out, so I have water moving out of the articular cartilage. I start to see a, a resistance to that because now those glycoaminoglycan uh, chains are starting to get closer together, and as they get closer together, they repeal each other to a greater extent. And as they repeal each other, they're winding up, they're wrapped around the collagen, so that collagen starts to create uh, a greater amount of resistance to the change in shape. So as long as the load is there and water is moving out, the more water that moves out, the greater the change of uh, or the resistance to that change in shape that that occurs. So the rate of fluid movement uh, in, is is really a function of of the pressure difference and the permeability of the tissue. And tissue permeability is dependent upon both the size and the complex of the, of the molecular domains. So as the glycoaminoglycan concentration increases, hydrostatic pressure moves fluid out, 
we have a, a greater resistance to the, cha to the change in the shape of the articular cartilage. So I may have greater mobility of the articular cartilage when it starts at five millimeters of thickness and it compresses to four millimeters of, of, of thickness and some of that fluid it extrudes out and then it starts to, to resist the change. So as it, it gets thinner, as more force is applied to the articular cartilage and now it's at, at two millimeters, there's going to be a, a significantly greater resistance to the change in shape than there was at five millimeters. So that's the uniqueness of how articular cartilage functions as opposed, uh, as opposed to um, you know, a, a meniscus, a fibro cartilage, um, a, fibro, a, a fibro cartilage as opposed to a, the articular cartilage. And there's a couple of different ways that articular cartilage lubricates. And one is, is uh, the, the concept of, of elastrohydrodynamic. And you know, synovial joints are subjected to, a, to a, a, an enormous uh, range of loading conditions. So if I'm looking at the hip, for example, and, and I'm walking along, and um, as I, as I sw move through the swing phase, and there's, there's not a tremendous amount of, of compression load on my hip joint, then the, there's greater sliding, so there's a greater opportunity for um, to decrease the friction of those two surfaces. So what, what I want to do is that sliding the squeeze during the swing phase, that film allows um, the film that, uh, of that tangential zone allows for minimal amount of friction, easy to allow the bones to, to slide back and forth across, the, across each other. But then I, I, uh, I stop and I stand for a while. And now as I've been standing, I start to get a higher load. So higher loads, slower um, sliding speeds. I start to see more of this fluid film uh, mechanism where the, um, where the fluid diffuses out of the articular cartilage and we get that greater resistance to the change. You can in fact see, um, if you've ever done this, if you've ever been down and, and, and sat on your, your heels for a while and, and in an extreme dorsiflexed position in the, in the ankle, the articular surface, you may stand up and, and, and it's like, God, man, my ankle doesn't want to move. That position where you have loaded the articular surface on the on the head of the tail on the on the tailored dome, you've created you've taken the articular cartilage, squeezed all the water out of it, so you've uh, you created a, a situation where there's minimal um, resistance to that, and you've kind of flattened out that cartilage. And what happens? You kind of shake it around a little bit, take the load off, and what happens? All that fluid gets diffuses back into the articular cartilage, and it's like, oh, okay, I can start to walk again. Now, but unfortunately, we have um, articular cartilage has a very, very limited capacity for repair and regeneration. Abnormal stresses can result in in uh, total failure. Um, one of the things that's interesting and and is is to look at lifestyle. In the, in the United States where we really don't take our, our joints through their full range of motion. And if we don't have adequate accessory motion, like you know, with a, the, the concave convex rule, if we're not really utilizing that accessory motion, we create abnormal loads on the joint surfaces and we end up with the onset of, of osteoarthritis. The progression is really a, the, a function of the magnitude of the imposed stresses and the total number of the sustained peaks. So if I have a situation where I have a number of, of loads, of abnormal loading, of repeated abnormal loading, the, the result can, re, can be a, a, a quick total failure in the articular cartilage. 
So, um, you know, maintaining healthy cartilage is really a function of taking joints through the, the, the normal and full range of motion on a regular basis. And maintaining, um, you know, and, and maintaining a, an, active, an active lifestyle. So that's what we'll end on articular cartilage. And, and um, again, articular cartilage is really um, the mainstay in maintaining normal joint function, normal joint motion. And, and as, that jo as that cartilage starts to wear out, you will see significant changes in joint function because the structure of the joint will change. I've got patients with articular, you know, with, with osteoarthritis in the knee who can't fully extend their knees because they have so much um, joint breakdown that the surfaces are no longer smooth and they may no longer be con convex. So, uh, you know, maintain that, that normal motion, um, maintain that, um, you know, the adequate, uh, uh, adequate motion, normal motion through the full range of motion.